Okay, good evening uh, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our great Jewish books course in memory of Dr. Mark Weinberg. We're excited to see everybody again. I see our winter exodus has already begun um, as our numbers are depleting uh, before our very eyes. So I have good news and bad news for you. So the good news is tonight we have a very special treat. Uh, Rabbi Yadidya Neumann of the uh, Kolo Torah Metzion is going to be presenting which is a very special treat for all of us on the topic of the Kuzari uh, by Rabbi Huda Halevi, which he will explain all about momentarily. The bad news is that this is our final week before our winter break. Uh, so since I, I winter always thins out, so I, we, we, we built into the schedule a little break. So go to Florida with a, without a guilty conscience. You're not missing anything. It's all fine. And for those of you watching at home uh, already in Florida, you know, it's all, uh, all recorded and online. But we're going to take a break from the, this will be our last week, and then we'll start up again on January 21st. Uh, will be our next class. You have a little bit of time uh, in the winter. I know the schools are off, people are going away, so we have a little break. I uh, look forward to seeing you all again uh, then. Tonight's lecture is sponsored by uh, uh, Janine Lumbrasso and family in memory of her beloved mother, uh, Suzanne, Sarah Bat David of uh, Emma, and in memory of her beloved brother, uh, Aldo uh, Lumbrasso, uh, Yitzchak Ben. Uh, Moshe Vitsara, may their memory be a blessing, and we thank you very much for sponsoring uh, tonight's class. And without any further ado, I present uh, Rav Yedidya Neumann. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, I have to say, uh, second before I left my house. Uh, my wife said, I don't recall you so, not no nervous, but like uh, intense before a uh, lecture or a shiur, or Hashem. I give many shiurim already. But, and that's what I want to thank all of you, and especially uh, the Weinberg family and Rav Freundich for initiating this uh, series. Because for me, it was a very special challenge and very special opportunity to speak and talk about uh, the Kuzari, about Rabbi Yudha Levi. To give a small, short introduction, first of all, I would say about what role does he take today in many rabbinical worlds, and then I will start talking about him. So if you go to uh, my world, my rabbinical world where I grew up in, which is uh, the Merkaz Arab world, I grew up in the high school of Merkaz Arab, uh, in the middle of the 90s, and then I went on and studied in a, a yeshiva, one of the biggest students of Rav Tzviyuda Kuk in Bet El, and um, I continued in that path. So the first book we ever studied in Emuna, when we were grade 9, was the Kuzari. That's the book we start with. Uh, the Kuzari. Uh, it's a very important book very spoken about book, very appreciated book. And I think in the end, in the last uh, part uh, of our show today, I will try to explain these ties and also the, I think the modern and practical applications that the Kuzari has till today and influences till today. It's a very, let's say, influential book till today, which is very rare on some of the books that we have on the list. Some of them are on the, on the shelf. But this book, I could say, has practical applications till today. So who was Rabbi Uda Levi? Rabbi Uda Levi uh, was born in the end of the 11th, uh, uh, yes, the 11th century, in a, approximately 1090, something like that, in Spain. Spain in that time, let's say, he is like a bit younger than the Rambam, we would say. Uh, we don't really know that they knew each other, but in that time, Spain in that time, as we all know, was a cultural center, but also a cultural mix between two influences. The North was Christian, the South was more influenced by the Arab world, by the Islamic world. Even we can say the clashes between these two worlds affected Spain all the time. The situation of the Jews sometimes was good, sometimes was bad. And as we all know, one of the biggest centers of Judaism in that time shifted from Babel 
to west, uh, western, shifted originally a bit through Europe to the Ashkenazic world, what we know, and from the south, I'm talking about the Mediterranean, yes? The south through Morocco, Tangier, and that area, then it started to go towards Spain. So from both sides, they came to Spain. From the northern side and the eastern side, and the uh, southern side. Rabbi Udalev V, which is a bit typical, we don't really know who his rabbis were. In fact, we don't even know exactly who his students were. He grew up, as I said, in that era, that time. He started, we would say, as a typical privileged boy. He went on, he studied medicine. It might even seem that uh, uh, in the beginning, he wasn't such a rabbi, we would say. He was an intellectual, but, uh, not but, we, for example, we have, I didn't bring it here, I brought, a, and you can say, in the, a, look at the back, I brought a, three songs. He was a poet. Three a, a, a pieces that I assume many of you know, but there's a kind of a, a literature that he wrote that you don't know. It is known, but it's not so known. He wrote songs, love songs, he wrote songs of what we call Shire Yain, about a mishte. That was a, a kind of a genre that they would write. It was like a, a Bohemian intellectual, for sure I assume he was uh, observant, but he was like, I think a modern and intellectual uh, man in that time. He went upon the, he was part of the upper circles in, the, in, in Spain, the beginning in the north, then he went south. He was like a many typical scholars, Jewish scholars. He was sponsored by a rich man. In fact, that rich man was murdered. He was a minister in one of the governments. And uh, in fact, that man was uh, even uh, murdered. And Rabbi Udalevi wrote a 73-part poem to praise that man and also to speak against the anti-Semitism that it's, not, it's a modern term, what I'm saying, but against the fact that they, they, they killed him because he was a Jew, and etc., etc. It seems, and I'm saying this because it seems that Abu Dhabi has a, had a very strong uh, life experience, I would say, and therefore, I won't even tie him, let's say, if we imagine a rabbi sitting in a yeshiva and having the experience, what he knew, and what happens in the yeshiva, it seems that, that that's not the case with Abu Dhabi. Further on in his life, he set his dreams to go to, uh, to Eretz Israel. So ne they never did it direct, just like Montreal. They never flew direct. Uh, they did it usually uh, through uh, Egypt. So he went down to Egypt. That we know he was, he was in Egypt. We also know that he set his eyes on going to Eretz Israel. And now we have a few stories or myths, depends what you know and what you believe. The researchers don't really agree what happened from there. The only thing we know that he arrived in Egypt in the mid end of 1140 and he was already dead. He passed away in the year after in Cheshvan of 1141. What happened in between in that year? So we know he was on a boat to Eretz Israel, we don't know if he actually got there. One thing he says, he never got there, and he is buried in, uh, in Egypt. One thing he says that he actually got to Akko, which was one of the main gates to Eretz Israel at that time. And then there's a miraculous story, if we all know, some of you know, about uh, that he went to the Kotel. He was in Yerushalayim, he was singing one of the songs. It's known that he wrote a lot of poems about him going to Eretz Israel. Libi ba Mizrach, Baluchi besof Ma'arav, Tzion alot Yishani, that which is one of the uh, poems I brought in here. Um, and by, according to that myth or that story, he doing, when he was reciting one of his poems and praising the fact that he's in Yerushalayim, he was bowing and an Arab on a horse, it was uh, driving a horse, uh, riding a horse and killed him doing that. The only problem with that is that 
It was the time of the Crusades, and the Christians were the ones who were uh, uh, controlling Yerushalayim at that time. So that's a bit of a problem with that story. So we don't really know what happened. For sure we know that he was on his way to Eretz Israel. For sure we know that he wanted and dreamt about that. Uh, and that's what we know about that. If you look at those three songs, these three songs that we, uh, we can see here, first of all, they're very typical. It's the last page, page number five. Uh, just to give us... So uh, on our left is the very known to you that I don't know if you ever paid attention to see that it's written by him, but it's very easy to know that it's written by him. How do we know that it's written by Rabbi Uda Levi? So there's a trick they would use in that mid-age era, which is called a Kostichon. Yes. In Israeli literature class, you are taught. So you see Yom Shabbat on El Nishkoach. You can see Yom Shabbat will start with Yud, and then Hayom Nichbad with a He, and then Uva Uchulam with a Vav, and then Diber Bekodshof with a Dalet, and then Ha'am Asherna with a He, which hints that he wrote Yehuda. For example, Dror Ikra Leven Bat was written by whom? Another guy from that time, Dorash Ben Levrat. And if you check Dror Ikra, it's again, it starts with Dalet Vav Nun Vashit. That's a tactic they would have. It's a very, very structured, it's beautiful uh, literature, really beautiful poetry. Uh, the second one, Yom Le'Avasha, some of the Ekes here in the room are supposed to know. When do we say Yom Le'Avasha? When do we say the Piyut Yom Le'Avasha? Pesach. Pesach, and another time? Jews, who's supposed to know this? When do we say Yom Le'Avasha? Yekish. Yekish, Yekish, Yekish. On a Brit Milah. We also say Yom Le'Avasha in a Brit Milah. Yes. Uh, so this is another pute, I have to say, my Yekish uh, side, my wife's side, my, my wife's grandfather, he knows it by heart, Yom Le'a Basha. He closes his eyes, he sings that entire song, he has a very nice, uh, uh, it's a very known poetry of Rabbi Dalavi, and the third one is one, I couldn't uh, hold myself, is one of the songs that he wrote about uh, Yerushalayim, which is a short version, really it's 15 verses. I brought in only three, in two and a half. In fact, this was a, a, a composed and arranged. It's a modern Israeli song. I brought, yes. Please. I wasn't asked. Usually I have no. I told you I am intense today. If I was. We sing with you. No, no, no. Yes. Which song? Sion Aloti Shali. That's uh, the Yerushalayim, won't you uh, take care of all uh, your people? He was talking about, about a lot about getting to Eretz Israel. He was a real Zionist, we would say. So that's Rabbi Uda Levi and his life. Now the book itself. So the book itself, uh, first of all, was written in... Jewish Arabic. It's not Hebrew. It wasn't written in Hebrew. It wasn't written in Arabic. It was written in a kind of Arabic that the Jews used. It's also they didn't write it in Arabic letters. They wrote it in Hebrew letters. But in Arabic. So that, of course, raises the, the question and the problem of translations. So ju just to, to give you a context, and this is not the first time I will do it, or the last time I will do it, if we compare it to the Rabbah, to Moren Evochim. Okay, let's set. The big kryptonite, the big, the big nemesis of the Kuzari in many ways is Moren Evochim, and we'll talk about it. But this is, this is a similarity. Both books weren't written in Hebrew. They were written in Arabic. The Rambam, we'll use the Rambam for a second, the Rambam, why did he write in, in Arabic and not in Hebrew? The Mishnah Torah he wrote in Hebrew. So that everybody could read it, understand? Yes. 
the philosophy, they wanted the public, everybody to read. It's for everybody to read. So they needed to write in a language that everybody will understand. While if the Rambam is writing halakha, or even trying to, let's say, replace the Talmud, he has to write it in the language of the Torah. He has to write it in Hebrew. So the Rambam wrote it in Arabic also. Abu Dalafi wrote it in uh, Arabic. And that raises the problem of translations. So uh, until 60, 70 years ago, the basic use translation of the Kuzari, which I assume some people here told me that they studied Rabbi Dalevi 50 years ago in college. So I assume the translation they used was Rabbi Uda Evan Tibon. Evan Tibon, that's the known translation to Hebrew. I don't know who translated it to English, but it's supposed to be very modern. But to Hebrew, it was translated by Rabbi Uda Evan Tibon. That was a family in, uh, I think, Italy and uh, it's fat that they were, they had the means, but also the uh, knowledge to do it, and they translated some of the books, and this is one of the books, Rabbi Uda Ebn Tibon, that was just the known translation for the last 300, 400 years. Uh, some of the commentators, and there are a few commentators on the book, like, look how appreciated this book was, Koli Huda is one of the commentaries on the book, written by a rabbi, Rabbi Uda Muscat, uh, written on this book like a, like a Rashi on the book. It uh, was written on that translation. 40 years ago, or 50 or 40 years ago, uh, an Israeli professor uh, wrote a new translation, which is today, if you go to a usual, a regular bookstore in Israel, that's the translation they will offer you. The white cover, if you saw it, I didn't bring my book here. The white cover, the usual one, it's, it's Yehuda Evan Shmuel. There is a tragedy in that family. The man was called Yehuda Cooperman, I think, or something like that, Kolfman, or something like that, and he named himself after his son. His son was tragically died, so he changed his name, and he was known as Yehuda Evan Shmuel, and that, for many years, that was and is regarded to be uh, the standard translation. I would say that in the last 30 years there is competition. A few rabbis and researchers uh, are working on that and writ wrote uh, different translations. One of them is Rabbi Yosef Kapach, the known uh, uh, Yemenite rabbi who translated also the Rambam. He criticized Ibn Shmuel that he didn't understand uh, Jewish Arabic. That was his criticism. Uh, there was another uh, translation out which is of Rabbi Yitzchak Shelat from Ale Dumim, but also a known professor, I assume if you did uh, already Moran Nebuchim, did you do already Moran Nebuchim? So Moran Nebuchim, in the last 10 years, there is a translation that conquered the world and is regarded to be the best one by a professor from uh, Tel Aviv University named Professor Schwartz. And he also wrote a translation uh, of the Kuzari, which is regarded to be a very fluent and modern, he wrote it into modern Hebrew. It's a very good translation. Uh, so these are the translations. I don't really know the English translations. I can only say that uh, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi David uh, Cohen, the Nazir, one of the biggest students of Rav Kook, when he gave a shiur on the Kuzari, they would sit with the Arabic origin. We have it. In Hebrew, yes. The Arabic origin. The translation of Rabbi Uda Ibn Tibon, the translation into English, and the translation into French. And they will, they would uh, compare. compare. So part of what we do, and I can say with one of my rabbis, I studied, I think, for more than six years, a weekly shiur on the Kuzari. And one of my rabbis, that what he would do. He would sit and only compare the translations. That's how sanctified this book is. We're not going to do this here. You should know. But I don't, um, yes. Because to understand every word, it's very, 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 very appreciated. Just one more thing I, I forgot before, and I think will give us something. 
Uh, when we think about the connections, I, I said like it seems that like Rabbi Yudal Aviv was totally unrelated to the rabbinical world of his time. It's not exactly co uh, correct. We do know there was a strong connection between him and the Ibn Ezra family. We all know Rabbi Avraham Ibn Ezra, the known commentator on the Tanakh, on the Torah. In fact, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Avraham Ibn Ezra quotes Rabbi Yudal Levi a few times. We will have it in Parasha, in Sefer Shmot, in the Perik Tech, Pasuk Aleph, for example, he quotes Rabbi Uda Levi. There is even a myth that Rabbi Uda Levi's daughter got married with Rabbi, Uda, Rabbi Abraham Ibn Ezra with his son. They were in-laws, that's what they say, but this is also something that was never proved, but this is something that uh, uh, might be true. So that's Rabbi Uda Levi, that's the books themselves. One more thing. I said it before that Rabbi Yudha Levi was regarded to be, a, by the rabbinical world, a very important book. In fact, when Rav Kook wrote his draft of how his yeshiva should look like and how, what will be the a, a program, program on, uh, how it should look like and who are the people who are supposed to know. So Rav Kook said, I want all my students I'm saying this because this never happened in his yeshiva practically. They never did that. But he wanted them to do and to learn and to be a scholar in five main books from the Middle Age era. The obvious one, of course, Moreh Nebuchim, Sefer Ha'ikarim, Rabbi Yosef Elbo, Emunot Videot, Av Hasad, Av Sad Yagon, Chovat Al Vavot, and the Kuzari. He's in the top five list. And I want to say something which is very weird. All of them are respected rabbis. But you will ask what's so special about the Kuzari and what makes it so uh, uh, unique. And we'll try to answer that. One more thing that when we think about Rabbi Yudha Levi, we know the Rambam, for example. Yes? The Rambam was a big, big philosopher. But also, not also, but simultaneously with that, he was a known Talmud Chacham. He has his commentary on the Mishnah. He has his masterpiece of Mishneh Torah. That's the Ramban. The Ramban, who comes immediately after Rabbi Yudha Levi, generation, is also, he is a known scholar, a very important philosopher, who wrote the commentary on the Torah, who wrote a book called Shara Gmul, dealing with the concepts of a, a faith and, let's say, how to relate to the punishment in the Torah. That's Shara Gmul. But of course, as we know, the Ramban, his main work was his commentary on the Gemara and his commentary on the Rambam. The Ramban was a, both of, they were both rabbinical authorities, halakhically authorities, and also philosophers. It seems that Rabbi Uda Levi is known for us only for that, with one exception. A, 80 years ago, um, no, 70 years ago, Rav Shlomo Yosef Zevin, a very known scholar in Eretz Israel, he's known for his series of books, Moadim uh, Ba'alacha, and others. He wrote uh, an article to show all the halakhic applications from the Kuzari. It's called the Kuzari Ba'alacha, and there is one very known application. In 1945, 44, 45, the Mir Shiva fled from Russia to China. But they're on their way to China. We don't know how it's on their way, but before they got to China, they went to Kube, or Kuba, I don't know how you say it. In, the, in, the, in Japan. Yes. Kobe. Yes. The steak is named after that? Could be. Okay. Okay. There's a steak named after that. Okay. And they didn't know it's, it's after the uh, line of date. How do you call it? 
Kaba Tarikh. So they didn't know whether well, they're supposed to do Shabbat, how they're supposed to do Shabbat. So they sent out a letter to many rabbis, mainly to uh, the Chazunish, to ask what to do. And the Chazunish used the Kuzari in order to defy. Kuzari deals with uh, the, the, the timeline, he deals with it in Ma'amar Sheni, in the uh, second chapter, second part of the book, and he used that halachic application for that. It's about the centralism of Eretz Israel. So that's one halachic application that we have from the Kuzari. We have a few others, but mainly he's not known for being an halachic authority. Okay. So, any more, uh, any, uh, any questions before we get into studying a piece? Something? <laughs> okay. So now, uh, we will try to learn together a piece. We know, first of all, before we start, we know that uh, you can write a book, a philosophy book, in uh, many ways. The typical way is to write it in a boring way. <laughs> like a lecture. I could say, and I'm now, uh, I gave my, we have in the college uh, four Bachurim in every year. I promised them that I would study Chabruta with, with each one of them. And we try to find what we can learn together. So one of my guys this year wanted to study with me, Moreh Nebuchim. I have to say, it's very, very, very boring. You chew on it, it's like, it's very, very boring. But it's not only boring, it, it, it's intentional, it's very, very intellectual, it, it, it comes and we will see it again, it's, it's very, very structured. While here, Rabbi Yudha Levi, he starts from a story, and the entire book looks like he's giving you, there's a plot here. He's not the first one to do it, we all know, for example, not that I read it so much, but I can at least name drop that uh, a Platon, Plato, as you call him here, he wrote his books with, based on dialogues. It's like kind of an argument, there is sometimes a plot about it. So here also this book starts from a story, uh, not only by a story, but even like an historical fact. If you want to check up, I, I have to say I don't really care if this story actually happened, but there is a non-religious uh, journalist in Israel that uh, made up a series checking about that nation, the Kuzarim. You can check it up. And uh, I can give a link and you can, uh, you can send it up. It's like in the mid 90s. He made a series, a documentary, about that three part documentary, I think, about that empire uh, uh, of the Kuzaris. That it is known, it was known that they became Jews. So let's start and read. I think you can get a lot, a lot from simply going into the introduction. So, I will read in Hebrew and translate simultaneously. We also have English here on the side if my English isn't good enough. Shaul 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 Says the Kuzari, I was asked by many people, what do I have to defend and to answer? And what, whatever is spoken against my people, against Am Yisrael. In fact, we would even say the, uh, uh, the non-official name of the Kuzari is the Kuzari. The real name is a Sefer Agana. It's an apologetical book that uh, he wrote in order to answer all the questions. So he says, I was asked many questions and how can I defend our nation? Vinizkarti, I remember, Zakharti, ma she shma'atim kom mitanot ha-chavir ha-shaya etzel melech kuzar ha-nikhnas betat ha-yehudim ha-yom ke-400 shana. Kasher nizkar ve-noda besifre divrei ha-yamim. He's in the 12th century, in 1850, 15 let's say, and he says, I was told, and I, I, I recalled, that there is a known story what happened 400 years ago, year 700, with the king, the king of the Kuzars, Kuzaris, that he had a bunch of questions, he asked the rabbi, and he was convinced to become a Jew. And then, 
it's like a plot in a plot. Now he starts from now on. The entire story is not about Rabbi Yudah Levi talking. It's about him writing down what is known to be the conversation between that king and Rabbi Yudah Levi. I think it's a bit hard to believe that he has such a long hand script of exactly what was the conversation between them. But it might be that this is like the these were the uh, main questions and the main answers. It seems to me that. What happened? What triggered that story? Why did the king of Kuzar start and start his questions? Why did he start his journey? I'm now in the second law in the second paragraph. Ki nishna alav chalom paanim rabot. He dreamt a dream many times. Ki ilu malach medaber imo veomer lo. Like an angel was talking to him and saying, your intentions are very good. You're looking for good. But what you're practically doing isn't good. He was a real formal. He was very stark in the Kuzar religion. He was the king. But even so, he was working in the Beis Amikdash of the Kuzarim, as he was very into it. He was trying to achieve something. Even though that he was trying to be very, very involved and intense in that religion, the angel would come to him every night. Your intentions are good. But your actions are not. It's very interesting that Rabbi Yehuda Levi starts the journey not by I have questions, philosophical questions. Who created the world? Why is it? It's not about uh, the world is unfair. Rabbi Udalavi starts from, I think, a very modern question that we have today. It doesn't stuck. It doesn't stick. It doesn't stick. I don't feel connected. There's a problem of disconnection between me and my actions. Yes, that's how the journey starts. We can even say more. It's about saying, it's not only about what you intend. It's not only about what you want, it's about how to practically do it. It's a very hands-on, in that note, it's a very hands-on approach. There is a right way how to do things. There will be a right way to do things. That's what he's looking for. He's seeking for good, but he's not finding it. And he's looking for not only what, but exactly how. And that's the journey. So, the Garam Lose, this is what pushed him, says Rabbi Udalevi, this is what pushed him to start that mission. To start and find his way in the religions in the world, in the beliefs in the world. He and many of his nation converted. And there are some things that that Chaver, that Rabbi, said that I, I, Rabbi Udalevi, I agree with. So therefore, I'm now writing down what he said. Okay, before I analyze this, let's continue a bit and let's skip. And then we will get, I think, to... Uh, Big perspective. So, as you see, I skipped from letter A, Aleph to letter Yud. Because in the middle, Rabbi Yud Alevi didn't go immediately to the Jews. Oh, the Chaver, the Melech Kuzar didn't go to the Jews. First of all, he went to the philosopher. The philosopher. Then he went to the Christians. Then he went to the Muslim. 
And with all three, he was still stuck with the problem. There is intention, but what exactly am I asked to do? And he says in the beginning, I don't want to go to the Jews. And again, let's start how he started. He started because of the national problem. The Jews were regarded to be lower class. Everybody hated them. They knew that they are smart. They knew that they are knowledgeable, scholars. But as a nation, we know that the situation of Am Israel was in Galut. Therefore, he said to himself, or Rabbi Uda Levi puts in the head of the king, the Jews are not the ones I should ask. But then finally he says, you know what, I have no, no excuse. I need to go to ask what's going on with them. That's what he says in, let's go down, in Yud. You see it's uh, paragraph 10, if you go by the English. Amar al-Kuzari. אני רואה שצריך אני לשאול היהודים מפני שהם שארית בני ישראל. These Jews are the last representatives of Am Yisrael מפני שאני רואה שהם הטענה כי יש לבורא תורה בארץ. Very interesting. Why should I go to the Jews? Because these Jews, they are the ones who represent, they show the option that the boy, the creator, he has a Torah in the world. We would say one of the most challenging aspects of being a Jew is the fact that we are told what to do all the time. <laughs> that we have a Torah. That Kodesh Bochu bugs us on whatever we do, from beginning to end, private and social, national. We are everything we have a mitzvah for. Every time, every hour, every event, and whatever occurs to, her, to us, we have something to do. Says the Kuzari, this is exactly what I'm looking for. But I would even say more. It's not only about the Torah, meaning only the practical action. And we will see it in a second. It's about the fact that we are not talking about, when we are talking about our religion, says Rabbi Dalevi, we're not talking about an idea. Judaism is not an idea. Juda Judaism is about, and I have to say, I rarely speak about Judaism. I don't like, like that terminology. I would say, I that Hashem. But here, since he's talking about who we are, I would use that terminology. Judaism is about how we show we, practical, physical people and nation, we show and we perform our connection with Hashem. It's about the physical and practical presence of Hashem in the world. It's not an idea for a few philosophers that have that idea and live in a cave, like the philosopher from, Greek, from Greece would say. It's not about that. It's about human beings connecting and relating to a ship. And we can see it immediately. He comes to the rabbi, and the rabbi starts, בלא אברהם, יצחק ויעקב, המוציא את בני ישראל ממצרים, באותות ובמפתים ובמסות, ומקלקלה במדבר, והמנחילה מתארץ כלל, אחר אשר העבירה את הים והירדן, ומופתים גדולים, ושלח משה בתורתו. ואחר כך כמה אלפי נביאים אחריו מזהירים את תורתו. I'm reading all of it intentionally in one piece, you will see why. ואחר כך כמה אלפי נביאים אחריו מזהירים את תורתו, ביעדים בגמול טוב לשומרה, ועונש קשה לממרא אותה. So what did he do? He told them from Bereshit till, let's say, Yirmiyahu, Yechizkel. He told them everything. We believe in, in what do we believe? In which God? 
He doesn't say Bereshit Noach, you see? He doesn't start from Parashat Bereshit Noach. Who does he start? From Lech Lecha. We believe in the God that was represented, that was spoken about by Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, who took out his people from Egypt and brought them to Israel and gave them the Torah. And immediately, you can see in paragraph 12, immediately, the Kuzari asks him, you forgot something. Every philosopher, every religion I talk to, what does he say about their God? He created the world. He is powerful. He will punish. He is the one. He didn't start with that. You started with saying that this is the God that your ancestors were talking about. He even says, that proves me. That proves me right. Why didn't they come to you before? It doesn't make any sense. You can see it in, in chapter... Uh, I knew I shouldn't have asked you. I knew that being in Galut so, so, so long, you're not on your game. You're not on top of your game. You're talking about... You should have said, You're a man. The one who is also uh, taking care of the world and Mashgiach, supervising the world. The one who created you and gave you books. And the Domela Sipur, you should have told me those stories. The typical, the typical priest, the typical religious man, that's what he says. He talks to me about how mighty his God, how strong he is that he owes him because he created him and he was the one giving him food. And this is, I have to say, the most crucial part of this book. It says the Chaver, this is exactly what I didn't want it. What you are saying says Rabbi Yudha Levi, what you are saying is typical for a religion <laughs> that is an idea. That we claim that everybody should recognize as rational. That everybody should understand. It's a philosophical argument. If that's so, so it's neutral. And I should start like a lecture in university I would say exactly like Morel Evochim and others, and start to argue. And every argument, I will start, okay, five introductions. That's how it goes in Morel Evochim and other books. Five introductions, we have five assumptions to say this and this and this. It's like a, a mathematical equation. Says Rabbi Yudha Levi, that's exactly what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about a mathematical equation, and you know what? It's not objective. I'm not talking about something that I'm trying to convince anybody outside of, of my religion. And exactly as he says, What you're talking about is an intellectual religion. What makes you to believe to it is after you thought a lot. And then you have lots of questions on it. Immediately, he tells them, you see me in 14, you done it. So now, you made me curious, but immediately, immediately you turned me off. So what you're saying now that you can't convince me? So what do you want from me? I would say, I didn't knock on your door. Who knocked on whose door? Don't forget that, that's part of it. Do we have a conversion program? No, we just, we don't try to convert anything. This is exactly this. You will say it bluntly in the end, I don't know if you look at that. 
He says that you can see in 26, in page 4, 26, that's exactly what he says. 26 and 27. אם כן, אני רואה שתורתכם אינה נתונה כי אם לכם. Your Torah is only yours. He says, you're right. We don't have, and this is very important in Rabbi Yudah Levi's world, we don't have any desire or any aspirations that everybody will become Jews. We don't even have complaints on them that they're not Jews. Because, because the reason we are Jews is very simple. We are Jews because we believe in what our parents told us. What we believe in is what we know generation after generation after generation. The kind of debates that Rabbi Uda Levi will have and has throughout this book is not the philosophy of proving that a world cannot exist without a creator. He would say, you know why I believe in God? Because I'm Israel, heard in its entirety in Ma'ad Sinai, everybody stood in front of Am Am Kodesh Baruch Hu and heard Hashem talking to them. That's the reason. And it can't be that 600,000 people are lying. That's it. How do I know that the world was created in seven days? Will say Rabbi Yudah Levi, I'll tell you why I know. That's in the second part. Because how can it be that the world works with weeks? We all know that the world is split into seven days. There's no astronomical proof to that. The world is not split into seven days. We have days, months, and years. How did we get to the concept of seven? Says Rabbi Yudah Levi, the fact that the entire world is doctored by seven days, comes from that. These are the kind of arguments that Rabbi Uda Levi has. And he says, it's subjective. It's not objective in a way that I think that everybody needs to believe in it. This is our story, I would say. And now I'm skipping to, to the end. I have a lot to say, but in a way, this is very, very, very modern or even postmodern in a way. It's talking about the Jewish narrative. It's more about who we are and what we believe in than in an objective idea that everybody can argue like and debate like in a philosoph philosophical debate. If I bring in his big, his big kryptonite, the Moral Evochim, the Rambam, the biggest quality of the Rambam is that it's very, very, very smart, very, very intellectual. But that's the biggest problem, would say Rabbi Udal Levi. I can argue with it. I can get mixed up. And we know, in the Hasidic world, for example, the biggest problem Rabbi Nachman has with anybody, for example, who is his biggest problem? The Rambam. And let's think about, I don't know if you were aware about Rabbi Nachman's story, but I will use one because you, I think he's using a story that uh, the Kuzari. The Kuzari, when he tried, and I brought it here in page 3 and 4, and in the book, through the book, he uses a few parables, Meshalim. <coughs> so he uses the Mashal, what we call Mashal Melech Hodu. How do you know that the king of India exists? So what's the answer? Because you have people who saw, who saw, <coughs> sorry, who saw that king, and they bring you things that only the king of India can bring, therefore you know that he exists. Have you ever seen him? No. How do you know? Because you see practical proof. And then he says, so what's Mashal Melech Hodu? Moshe Rabbeinu going up to heaven, receiving the Torah, and bringing it down. When Rabbi Nachman wants to make fun out of the smart guy, the, the wise person, he has a famous tale called Maasei Michacham Betam. In that tale, he makes that wise man so weird that he was able to convince 
the messengers of an actual king, that that king doesn't exist. <laughs> that's in the story of Maaseh Micham Betam. But that's exactly what Abu Dhabi is showing us. You can ask many questions, but hands on, that's what you see. You see and you'll show. Can you prove it to anybody else? Maybe not. Maybe not. So we don't have any complaints on anybody else. That's what we believe in. That, I think, is the, if I need to summarize what's I, for me, and I think <coughs> is a very important cornerstone in, uh, in this book, is exactly that. It's the... Uh, uh, This way of, this approach is not about the intellectual, it's about seeing it in your eyes and believing in the known, let's say, the known knowledge, accepting it based on experience. If I skip to today, through the rabbinical world first, so we know that, as I said, in Merkaz Arab world, it's a very, very important book, but not only. We know that the students of the Gra appreciated this book a lot. We have testif testimonies of students of the Gra praising this book, saying that this is the most important book that you should study. We have from Tzotah Hoshin, a very known commentator, on the Shulchan Aruch, who also says that, this is a very, very important book that's in the last 300 years, very, very appreciated, very, very uh, uh, studied, I would say. I would say out of the five books I mentioned before, the two main books that are studied a lot and influential, influential is the Kuzari and the Moreno Bukhim. In the philosophical world, I would say that we know in the last 100 years, if we start from uh, uh, the philosophers even before World War I and World War II, but between the wars, we had a philosopher named Henry Bergson, who spoke about a theory called phenomenology. <coughs> I can say it in Hebrew, phenomenology. And he would say that the most basic thing I can argue is what I experience. This is very enlightening. I can talk a lot, does this exist? What is it? But I can say, this is what I experience. I experience it. Talking about your experience. Afterwards, as we know, after World War II, we have what we have, the existentialists. Guys, I don't know how to say it in English. Existent existentialists, how do you say it in English? Existentials. okay. Those French guys, yes? Sorry. Yes. Yes, you can say it in French, so. Yes. I don't have such a nice uh, French accent, I can say. Okay. You can even see it, if I go back to the Jewish world, you can see it many, a lot, in the Solovetic work. Yes? About talking about the way I see it. The way I experience something. But I would say, argue, there is a big difference. Oh. Um, that I would say that Rav Kook used the Kuzari to go to the next step. When I say that it is the way we experience it, when we say that this is the way Am Israel is receiving it, it is to say that every creature in the world has a connection to Hashem. One of the known arguments that the Kuzari has, he is the most blunt to say that Am Israel is special. The Kuzari says, he uses the terminology of Sgula. He even says, when he describes that era between Bereshit and Lech Lecha, he speaks about Garin Veklipa, that we have the pure and we have the seed. He seems to be very racist. But when you read what he's saying, he's not saying it in a way that everybody else is nothing. He's talking about what we would say today, essentialism. 
that everything has its own essence. That's why he would talk a lot about, for example, about the relations between domain, how do you say domain? Tzomeach, chai, what? Domain is inanimate. Inanimate, and then you have the vegetables, then you have the animals, then you have the metaper, the humans, and then you have the Jews. That's what he says. But he doesn't say it in a way, it's not to say that we are superior in a racist way. It's to, so, to show that what? That each level, each layer, has its own way to relate to Hashem. Again, because it's not about the idea. If it's an idea, so anybody, if it's smart enough, could, be, could relate to that. It's not about that. When he would <laughs> speak about what's the role of Am Israel in the world, he would say, Lev by Varim, the heart and the organs. So everybody shouts at him and says, ah, you're making Am Israel a racist. We are the heart, but you forgot one thing. Who works the hardest in the world, in, 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 the, in the body? The heart. It's not to be superior. It's to have responsibility. And the most important part is what? Is to look at the world as one organ. The world is one organ. It goes back to what he said before. Am Israel is supposed to and asked to relate to Hashem and to acknowledge Hashem. That's what we want. The others, they have other roles in the world. And it's okay. No problem. You see how important you start from one, it seems to be like a methodology that he's insisting, but it, it goes everywhere in his writings. If you talk about an idea, an intellectual idea, it's very hard to understand. But if you talk about the way we experience it, and I think the world, that's what I started now. The world is shifting to acknowledge that. But not in a way that everybody experiences whatever he wants, in the way that from those French guys we got to the postmodern era, that everybody could say whatever we want because that's the way I relate to it. No. There is one thing to talk about. There is one action that you're supposed to do. But yet, it doesn't come from understanding comes from relating to it and connecting to it. This is what Rabbi Yudha Levi, writing almost a thousand years ago, was trying to push forward. And I think that's the reason that many, many, many people today see him and look at this book as a cornerstone of their understanding of who Am Israel is, who they are. He has a long essay during the book. He deals a lot with how does an individual need, how should a righteous individual look like? He talks about lots of stuff. Also, the philosophy of uh, the literature, which is a very, very modern topic in the last 40, 50 years from Wittgenstein and others, is a very, very uh, important subject. He spoke about that 900 years ago. Uh, so that's in a nutshell. I have to say, it did give me a lot to think of. And uh, okay, Shalkoach. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you. 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 And winter's going to be over when you come back on the 21st. Yeah. 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 This is a decree uh, by the rabbi. That's it. It's gone. Um, to, and then this coming uh, Shabbos, we have a special uh, uh, guest visitor from Renewal, uh, the kidney donor organization in New York that helps connect uh, those who want to donate kidneys to those uh, Jews uh, needing to receive kidneys. Um, I hope it will be of a great interest of both, both from those of you who are ready to give your kidney and uh, just time to be able to, uh, to support this organization. They'll be speaking uh, Shabbos right after Musaf and hosting a special uh, Malava Malka Saturday night here in which we'll hear from an actual uh, member of the donor-recipient uh, team and their experiences with uh, Renault. So I hope you'll come out to support this very important organization, literally, literally, literally saving Jewish lives. Uh, they've had over 500 uh, kidney donations so far. Uh, that have gone through them, really amazing things. So see you all on the 21st, and see you all over Shabbos. Thank you again. 
and have a good evening. Marv, 9 o'clock right now.